call to worship? Come, the banquet of hope and praise is ready. We come on Jesus' invitation, seeking to be fed. Feed on the love of God in Jesus Christ. We come on Jesus' invitation, needing to be healed. Be healed by God's gracious mercy. We come on Jesus' invitation, longing to be forgiven. Here you can find love, mercy, and forgiveness. Thanks be to God. Now please join in singing hymn 656, Take Time to Be Holy. We do not know what has become of him. 
And Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all of the people took off the rings of gold which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a molten cap. And they said, these are our gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on, that, on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf, and have worshipped worshipped it and sacrificed to it, and said, These are our gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. But of you, I will make a great nation. But Moses besought the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does thy wrath burn hot against thy people? who thou hast fought, brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them forth to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Thy servants to whom you did swear by thine own self, and did say to them, I will multiply your descendants as stars of the heavens, and all of this land that I promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do to his people. The second reading is taken from Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a marriage feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the marriage feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, Behold, I have read, made ready my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves are killed, and everything is ready. Come to the marriage feast. But they made light of it and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Then he said to the servants, The wedding is ready, but those invited are not worthy. Go, therefore, to the thoroughfares and invite to the marriage feast as many as you find. And those servants went out to the streets and gathered whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garments. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth, for many are called, and but few are chosen. 
This is the word of the Lord. Hi, Logan. <laughs> um, Logan, have you ever been invited to a wedding? You don't know? I think you were at mine. Oh, Xavier was Logan was it? You were invited. You just been come because for most because most of you know that Steve and I got married right here in this church in Utah um, in April, April 22nd. And do you know, have you ever been to a wedding, Logan? Yeah, like it's a great big feast usually and a lot of people gathered and, and things. But do you know, it takes a lot of planning to get ready for a wedding. And do you know what, since it's so new, I still have my wedding planner folder that probably drove Steve crazy because I think um, part of the planning of a wedding for a couple is just to see if you can survive it so you can see if you can be married or not. But um, anyway, I have a folder in here for the reception and the meal and for a photographer and for the printing company and for a cake and for the florist and the church and pastor and pianist and vocalist and all of those great people and gifts for all of those people. And oh yeah, oh yeah, the biggest one is the wedding list of all the people that we were going to invite. And you know, Steve and I decided we were going to have a small wedding and then um, people seemed to get mad when they didn't invite them. So we rented a bigger hall. So what did I do? Invite more people. And um, we ended up with a very large wedding, um, didn't we? Even though we were going to keep us off, but anyway, we had a good time. And unlike the story in the parable today, we did have lots of people come. And in fact, I knew about how many people were coming to the reception, but I didn't know about how many people were coming to the church that day. And it was raining, if you all recall. And I was, we were pleasantly surprised at the number of our friends and family and of uh, my church family and everyone who showed up because it was basically standing room only in here that day. So unlike the gentleman, the guy in this, the scriptures who was disappointed, we were pleasantly surprised. But I do know that the dad in the scriptures probably did put a lot of work into planning for the wedding of his son, right? And how disappointed they must have been. So what did they do? They went out and just invited everybody. And everyone that came, good or bad, right? And the, the one guy wasn't dressed appropriately, so, so the guy got all upset and they were going to sh- sh- um, throw him out of the reception. So um, Jesus really likes to talk in parables. And he's really talking about God being the king and his son would be Jesus. And all of us have this wonderful invitation to a celebration in heaven someday. But we have to show up to that invitation dressed appropriately. Probably not our clothes, but our hearts have to be ready for that invitation to be fulfilled. So just remember that everything we do on a daily basis, we need to do to honor God. So we're ready to to claim that invitation someday. Okay? Let's get prayer. Still have to hold my hands. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for inviting us to your party. Help our hearts be ready to receive it. Amen. I was sick this past week and I did not get anything done. So I am way behind now. Um, so starting tomorrow morning, I have a million things to do. A million. A million? Wait, wait, wait a minute. Have you ever heard that expression? You have a million things to do? No, I don't have. Even though I was out all week, I don't have a million things to do. I have several things to do. Hyperbole, once again. And the greatest example of hyperbole that I I always like, it comes from one of my favorite movies, and I know a lot of your favorite movies as well, It's a Wonderful Life. You know the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. You know, we're going to start watching it as we get closer and closer to Christmas again now. Um, And George Bailey, of course, 
in that story was a young man first um, in high school, and he sort of had a crush on this girl named Mary, if you remember. Um, and they both ended up going to this dance. They didn't actually go together, but they were both at the dance, and they ended up dancing together on the high school gym floor. Do you remember that? And this was a real strange gym floor, and they were doing jitterbug and everything else and dancing and just really into each other. And they didn't notice that somebody had flipped the switch, and the gym floor actually opened up, and there was a swimming pool underneath it. Have you ever seen that before? But, but anyway, I, you know, it was in the movie, so you know, we'll go with it. And of course, George and Mary are dancing along there, and eventually they end up in the pool, uh, soaking wet. And then the next scene, you see them, they're walking home. George is walking Mary home. Do you remember that scene? Mary has on this bathrobe, and George has on this stupid looking sweater thing. You know, they've obviously put on some dry clothes because all their clothes are soaking wet. And they're walking home, and this big moon is shining up there in the sky. Do you remember that? And George, he's getting, you know, he's getting pretty much into this at this particular time. And George says to Mary, Mary, whatever you want, just ask me. Whatever, anything you want. If Mary, if you want the moon, you just ask me for it. And I'll throw a lasso around the moon and pull it down and give it to you. No, it's not Hyperbole. George is using hyperbole there with his... Uh, his beau, his, his girl, he's uh, exaggerating a little bit, but he's trying to make the point to her, a very important point, of course, he thought, and that's why we use hyperbole, is to make an important point. Now, all of that setup about hyperbole to get you to my church history instructor that I had in seminary, second and third year that I was in seminary, I had this church history instructor. He was a young man, a lot younger than me, actually, and he made some outrageous statements in a seminary, in a church history class. Now, I was an old history teacher. I taught history for many, many years. And there's certain things you're supposed to say and not say as a, the authority when you're up there in front of the classroom. You don't make these crazy, outrageous statements about what may have happened. But this professor did. He did it very regularly. And he was funny. He was outrageous. He was sarcastic. He was very interesting to listen to. And of course, there, there were lots of us that were older than him that would often challenge him on what he would say and, and these outrageous statements that he would make. And there was one statement that he would say almost every class period, at some point in the class period, he would make the same statement because I think he wanted us to remember it. And this is the statement that he would make. He said, I'm prone to hyperbole. I'm prone to hyperbole. So if you quote me directly outside of this class, I may have to call you a liar. Now that may have been why he was only there for two years, because uh, <laughs> he made that statement quite regularly in class, but he was telling us that he was making these exaggerated statements. And the reason he was doing that was to try to get us to think, to try to shake us up a little bit, to try to get us to to open ourselves up to different perspectives, to be able to question him and to question other things that we might have read about in history and, and try to get a better understanding of what was going on. And, and I thought it was an interesting way to try to teach, particularly church history, um, but I will admit that it had an impact on me. I was affected by it, and it did change my perspective because what he was trying to tell us with that statement is that what he was saying we didn't necessarily take it as truth, but we were supposed to take it seriously. It was supposed to move us. It was supposed to have some impact on us, even if it was not literally true. And let me tell you, he told us a lot of things that I know couldn't have been literal truth. Um, but he did it for impact, and it was very interesting being there as a part of that class. As I read the gospel parable that we have here this morning, I'm reminded of that church history teacher, professor that I had at seminary. Because as I read this parable that Jesus is saying, I'm wondering to myself, is Jesus actually using some hyperbole here? Let's think about it for a minute. The parable that Joan just read is often called the King's Son's Wedding Feast. 
And the king is giving this huge feast, this huge party, and a celebration of his son's wedding. And the king makes all of his preparations, and of course he sends out all these invitations, and he wants everyone to come. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever received an invitation to a party? Not Joe and Steve's reception, I know. But have you ever received an invitation to a party that you didn't really want to go to? That you thought, well, I, you know, I, I don't really want to go to this. It's not something I'm really interested in at the time. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm not really interested. I, I don't think I'm going to go to this party. And so you get the invitation and you read the invitation and you realize that's not a party that you really want to go to. And so, of course, the next thing you do is you go out and you find the mailman and, and you rough him up and you kill him. <laughs> oh, you, you've never done that? That's what happens in this parable. I think Jesus might have been prone to hyperbole when he was making that kind of statement. And then the story goes on. And of course, you know, uh, most people don't come. They even killed the, you know, the messenger who, who brought them the invitation. They don't come, and the king is, you know, he's very disappointed in the fact that they don't come, and so he's going to invite a lot of other people, all kinds of people, both good and bad. So let me ask you this. Um, have you ever given a party, a big party, a celebration of some sort? And you're the host of the host. And you've given that party, and you've worked, as Joan was talking about, I mean, for weeks, for months in advance, preparing and planning. And I mean, you've got everything led and ready, and everything's laid out, and everything's ready to go there. You're, you're ready to have this party. And a lot of the people don't show up. They just don't come. I don't know if that ever happened to you. But then, of course, of course, what you're going to do is, you're going to go out. And you're going to murder those people and burn their houses and destroy their city. Right? No, that's what it says happened in this story. I think Jesus might have been prone to hyperbole in telling, when is that going to happen? It didn't happen 2,000 years ago. It's not going to happen today. You're not going to do that. And, you know, it's got to be. It's got to be an exaggerated claim. It's got to be hyperbole. It's Jesus is using in this particular parable to make a point. And I think the point that he made, is trying to make has to do with invitation. He's moving in the story from hyperbole to invitation. And that's what I'm going to be trying to talk about a little bit this morning. Shall we pray? Gracious God, May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This parable of the king's son's wedding is so outrageous, it's so shocking that it, that it begs to be taken seriously, but I think not literally. Not literally. It begs to be taken as truth, but not as historical fact. Besides, if you listen to this parable and you conclude that God is an angry king, like it's talked about in this parable, or like maybe we heard about in the Exodus passage where he was going to kill all of his chosen people, and if he doesn't get his way, then God is going to destroy his people and burn their cities, you know, that simply doesn't fit with the God that is revealed by Jesus Christ throughout all four of our, our Gospels in the New Testament. If we tell this particular story as the Gospel truth, I think Jesus might call us liars because that's not how it's meant. No doubt this is a parable of judgment, but it may, may not be the judgment that we think it is. Speaking about that first group of guests, the king says, those invited were not worthy. By implication to our way of thinking, well, if he says those that were invited first were not worthy, well, then the second group that came, they must be worthy, right? 
that, that, that's sort of how we think of, of, of implication of judgment. <coughs> and I think we, as human beings, we, we tend to get nervous. And I think we tend to get a lot fearful when God begins making judgments. If we're calling this a judgment that God is making. Worthy? Not worthy. Well, are we in the first group? Not worthy? Are we in the second group? As the worthy people. Are we worthy? Are we unworthy? What does this parable mean for us? And I suspect that our nervousness and fear about God's judgments arise from the assumption that we make as human beings that God judges us in the same way that we judge other people. And you know, when we judge other people, when we make judgments about other people, our judgments are, are often judgments of exclusion. Judgments of exclusion. Um, <coughs> we're excluding others. We're judging them. We're saying, no. You know, they're, we, we have come down them. We've judged them. They're excluded from whatever it should be. Whatever it could be. Well, I'd like for you to think about something this morning. What if it's just the opposite with God? As it so often is what if Jesus in this parable is trying to shock us into seeing that the kingdom of heaven is not business as usual according to human standards what if God's judgment on our lives is a judgment of grace a judgment of acceptance a judgment of invitation really a judgment of inclusion instead of exclusion. If that's true, if God's judgment on us is a judgment of inclusion, then what is it that separates the first invited guest in this parable from the second group of invited guests? The difference is that one was more deserving than the other. The first invited guests were the recipients of the king's invitation. They were obviously the recipients of the king's favor in the first part of the story. But so were the second invited guests. They were also invited guests. And so was the man who showed up without a wedding room. They were all invited. They were all favored. None of them had done anything to, to deserve the king's invitation. It was just given. And I think Jesus is saying if that's true for them, it's also true for us. We are all invited. We are all included. The difference isn't that the king likes one group more than the other group. His sole motivation in this parable is to share his banquet. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to share his banquet. He wants someone he wants anyone, he wants everyone to join in his joy and celebration and be part of his kingdom and part of his life. That's what he's looking for in this particular parable. Both groups of people were given that opportunity. If that's true for them, Jesus is saying it's also true for us. All are invited. The difference isn't just that, that, that some of the guests were good and some of the guests that were invited were bad. There is no distinction whatsoever made based on behavior, based on beliefs, based on attitude, or based on their morals. To the contrary, with that second round of invitations, did you hear that? The king sends out his servants into the streets with the instruction to invite everyone they find. And they did they went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. If that's true for them, Jesus says that's true for us as well. We are all invited. We are all included in God's judgment of God's people. 
Now, that's probably not the kind of social life most of us live or most of us offer to another person or most of us certainly receive from other people. But this parable is talking about God's kingdom. It's not talking about our kingdom. It's not talking about any type of human celebration. It's talking about God's feast and God's kingdom. So what is it? What is the difference between those who are called worthy in this parable and those who were not? There's only one thing. There's only one thing in this story that distinguishes the first invited guests from the second invited guests. Presence. Presence. That second group showed up. The first invited guest didn't even show up. But the second group, the wedding hall was filled with those second invited guests. But the first invited guest would not even come. That's the only difference in this story between those two groups. So I think Jesus is saying the key to our life in God is just to show up. It's to be present. Wow, now that's, that's really a lot easier said than done. To be present is actually difficult work. To be present in another's life and to be present um, it's difficult to be present to another person, much less to be present to God. Because to be present to someone else means, means establishing that other person as our priority. That's our priority in life. If we're going to be present to that other person. It means seeing them for who they are and not what we want them to be or what we think they should be. It means seeing them as they are. It means opening ourselves up to receive their lives into our own life. It means the vulnerability of entrusting and giving our life to another. To be present. It means really listening to what they say and not just hearing what we want to hear. It means letting go of our own agendas, our own distractions, our own fears, and our own prejudices just to be present to them. It means bringing and offering all that we have and all that we are to that person. That's being present to another. And if we're not doing those things with other people, we're probably not doing those things with God either. Instead, we too often go our own separate ways. We go to our businesses, we go to school, we go to work. We're too busy. We're too tired. We're too distracted. There's work to be done. There's money to be made. Uh, we make light of the other's life and what may be offered to us. And if we don't earn it, if we haven't worked for it, we assume it doesn't really have much value. You know, that's what our society tells us. You get what you pay for, right? That's, that's, that's the way it is. We're convinced that there are better things to do and better places to be. That's exactly what the first invited group did. I don't want to go. I don't want to show up. I don't want to be there. There are better things to do. Better places to be. It's exactly what they did. What they did not realize, and what we sometimes don't realize either, is that really it, there is no life outside of God's banquet. No true life outside the kingdom of God. To show up and to be present is to be worthy before God. It's that simple. And it's that difficult. We don't earn or prove our worthiness as a prerequisite to entering the banquet. We can never earn or prove our worthiness. We just show up. We just be present and we discover for ourselves the worthiness that God has always known about us. And that, that's when our lives begin to change, my friends. But wait a minute, Pastor Steve, there's one more person in this story. There's a guy who did show up, but he didn't have a wedding robe on. What, what's that all about here? 
Well, I think, as, as Joan was mentioning, I think this is more than a dress code violation of going to a wedding party. Something else was missing. Did you hear what else it said about this man? Besides the fact that he didn't have his, a wedding robe on? He was speechless. He was speechless. He didn't have anything to say. It was as if he wasn't really there. He was a bump on the log. Jesus is reminding us that there are times when we show up, but we're not really present. Our body is there, but our minds are left in the room. So here's what I wonder about this guy. What if this man had said something? What if he hadn't been speechless? What if he had said anything? What if he had just made his presence known? Not so much to the king, but to himself. What if he had said something like, I was hungry, I smelled the food, I heard the invitation, I trusted you to feed me. What if he, was, what if he said, I was lonely and I saw the lights on and I trusted you to take me in. What if he had said, I was thirsty, I knew there would be water, I knew there would be wine, I trusted you to give me a drink. What if he said, I was naked, I knew people would be well dressed, I trusted you to clothe me. What if he said, I was sad and grieving, I heard music and laughter, I trusted you to share your joy. What if he said, I was empty, I saw abundance, I trusted you to help fill me. What if he had said, I was dying, I saw the door was open and I trusted that you could help give me life. What if he had said any of those or a thousand other things like them? You know what I think? I think it would have been enough. He would have shown up then with all that he had and all that he was. He would have been present in the king's or God's company. And then the king would have said to him, Oh, my dear friend, I'm so glad you got the invitation. I'm so glad you're here. You are worthy. And Jesus says that that's true for Him. It's also true for us. Just show up and be present to the Spirit of God. And then you are worthy. You are invited. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us respond to our word this morning by rising once again either in body or in spirit and singing our hymn of response, which is page 488, Just As I Am. Shall we rise together and sing our response?
You may be seated. Please join with me now in the Apostles' Creed, which you find printed in your bulletin this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now come to that place in our service where we have an opportunity to give back, to share of what we have been blessed with in our lives, to share with those who are in need, with all of those who suffer and feel pain in this day and throughout God's kingdom. We want to share His love and peace with them. So as our ushers come forward this morning and as our choir sings our special music, be generous in your gifts.
God, we love to hear and to tell your story. And we ask now that these tokens that we offer before you be used to help spread your story throughout this world so that your kingdom can become a reality for all. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Let us now pause for just a moment of silence as we prepare our hearts and our minds for prayer. Shall we pray? Almighty God, in the midst of today's turbulent and often troubling times, we take refuge in you now in prayer. Allow us to take a deep breath and to always remember that you are God, are our refuge and our strength. You are our rock and our redeemer. Let your spirit flow over us now as we rest in your peace. Thank you, good and gracious God. Jesus reminded us again and again that we are to care for the sick, for the poor, for the downtrodden, for they will always be with us. Our God, give us the will and the strength to reach out to those in need, and to share your love with them this day. Both those that we may have mentioned by name or have listed in our bulletin, and those many who are unmentioned, unlisted, but who we hold in our thoughts and in our prayers. May your peace surround them, and may your love embrace them now. Continue to be with us, our God, as together, we repeat the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now rise one last time, either in body or in spirit, and sing together our closing hymn, which is, O oh Jesus, I Have Promised, found on 676 of your number. Shall we rise and sing?
Oh, give me grace to follow. And that's the call that we all have. As we were reciting together the Lord's Prayer, it made me think of this brief item that I will mention about the hot loggers. Um, because I know most of you, or most all of you probably, will not be able to go to her service. Um, two weeks ago today, on that Sunday afternoon, in Dot's room, Dot, her daughter-in-law, her husband, and two of Dot's friends gathered around Dot's bed and they held hands and they recited the Lord's Prayer together. And as they said, Amen, Dot passed from this world. And Barbara, Dot's daughter-in-law, said it was a beautiful and a peaceful passing because that prayer had meant so much to Dot throughout her lifetime. So I hope when we recite these prayers, when we, when we say these confessions together on Sunday mornings, that you don't just say them, that they actually mean something to you. Because there are times in life when those words that we have heard so often that we seem to be so familiar with can mean so much to us. So I thank God for, for being there for Dot at that time when she was passing from this world to the next. And I hope that you will keep her in your prayers on Thursday morning. This week should be a cooler week. It's supposed to feel like fall. Uh, the leaves are starting to fall in abundance out where I live anyway, um, which means, of course, you're going to have to break the brakes out here before too long, but that's all right. Uh, that's a nice part of fall as well, uh, to get out and enjoy that uh, type of, of exercise and activity. So whether you're out raking leaves or just enjoying the day, whatever you find yourself doing this week, always remember that God, God is right there with you. Because God, God is always above us. God is always below us. God always goes behind us. God always goes before us. And God always stands right beside us. And most importantly of all, when we most need our God, God is right there inside us as well. Go in peace this day, my friends. Amen.